Welcome to the Money Maven Project Podcast. If you're here to learn how to obtain freedom over your time and money through real estate investing, you're in the right place. Create the life you want by living with intention and becoming a maven in mindset, money, and real estate. Now, here's your host, Justin Monk. Hey, this is Justin Monk with the Money Maven Project Podcast. Super excited today. Have Megan Greathouse on the podcast today. Been trying to set this up for a few weeks. Uh, heard her originally on the Bigger Pockets podcast. I'm like, hey, that looks like a, that's that's somebody I want to have a conversation with. So, uh, Megan, thanks for jumping on. Thank you, Justin, so much for having me. Yeah, there's been a little bit of back and forth. You and I both are doing this, you know, career and family balance. But I'm glad we are making it work today. Yep. Yeah, this is going to be awesome. So tell us a little bit more about, um, in summary, where you started um, and what kind of got you started into real estate and then where you are today, what you're focused on. Sure. Yeah. So my you know early background is I was a military kid and then after college actually joined the Marine Corps myself. So I was active duty for four years there. Um, got out, used my GI Bill to get an MBA because I thought, hey, that sounds like a smart move. Mm -hmm. Ended up mm -hmm. doing marketing in corporate America for four years um, and then left my full time job in January of 2019 because I had started to build this kind of small but mighty real estate portfolio. And it was giving my husband and I, you know, not necessarily cash flow that we were just going to start living on uh, right away, but the flexibility to let me leave work, spend a little more time with our kids, and also continue to build this real estate business um, while he held down the nine to five job for a while longer. Uh, so that's where I am today. I have a, a portfolio of 10 units and they're all you know duplexes and four families. And I'm actually currently working on scaling up to a 16 unit or larger building for my next purchase. So I started kind of in 2015. We kept our first house as a rental when we moved to our current home and then uh, decided that to oh, in the water was a good test. We liked what we saw. And in 2017, started buying in earnest. So from 2017 yeah. to 2019, um, bought 10 units and renovated about half of them, got rents up. They're pretty well stabilized at this point. So I'm looking to make that next jump. Yeah, that's cool. And I love how you lay out the timeline there because a lot, I know a lot of new investors get really impatient with the process of like, Hey, I, I've been doing this for a year and I don't have a hundred doors yet. Like what's going <laughs> on? What's wrong with me? And so I love to see you lay that timeline out of what it's taking. You know, nobody has ever come on and said, Hey, yeah, you know, I've been doing it for two years and I have 200 doors. It, nobody's ever said that. You know, I think I, I had a, a Matt Faircloth on just the other day and I think he started in like 2005 and so he's, you know, whatever, 15 years and now he's, he's done like $45 million in, in deals. And I'm like, people need to remember that it takes a little while to get, to get that momentum and, 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 and to be patient with the process. So thanks for breaking that yeah, down. Yeah, um, absolutely. And I think a big kind of point in there too, is it's, there's a trade-off involved with your growth. So if you are willing to put 80 to a hundred hours in every week. It's the only thing you do. Um, and that's, you, you love it to that point. Yeah. Maybe you could scale bigger, faster. My goal was more time with my family. We have two young kids, a four-year-old and one-year-old. And my why behind all of this was them and was our family and, um, spending time and money on experiences and traveling and doing things together. So it would have been a little counterproductive to say, well, I'm just going to take the first few years of their life and, uh, work 80 to hundred hours a week. And then maybe by the time they're in grade school, I can spend time with them. Um, so I've chosen maybe a slower ramp up, but in the long run, it's still going to pay off for my family and I get to spend time with them along the way. Yeah, that's perfect because those those young years are obviously you never get those back with those kids. Um, and this is a totally different direction than what I was thinking to talk about today. But I wanted to you make you make a really cool point there. Um, the other day I had this thought of like we've got to be careful to not sacrifice the end for the means, meaning. If, if your end is spending more time with your family, never sacrifice that for the means, which is just investing in real estate. And I think I see all these, you know, Instagram is, is, has tons of these, you know, sacrifice what you want today for what you want tomorrow. And I'm like, true, 
but let's sacrifice watching Netflix, not what we actually want to accomplish. Um, right. I go to the gym a lot. Uh, well, I go to the gym, try to go every day. And, and honestly, I mean, I like to be in shape and be healthy, but, uh, ultimately I go to the gym because I want to perform better when I go hiking and when I explore in the outdoors and stuff like that. And there was a couple of times where I'm like, Oh, you know, I could go for a hike tomorrow, but I've got to go to the gym. And then I'm like, wait, <laughs> I'm sacrificing, you know, I'm sacrificing the end for the means. I'm like, that's that we're missing the point there. And does that make sense? Am I explaining that? It's just a new thought in my Absolutely. mind. That makes sense. No, I really love that. That's a great way to keep things in perspective because there are things that your sacrifices you're going to make. You know, I sacrifice, like you said, Netflix, I sacrifice uh, relaxing evenings for evenings of getting a couple extra hours of work in after the kids are asleep. Yeah. Uh, sometimes I sacrifice some of my own sleep, but yeah. I try to keep that time with my kids and my family in focus. Cause that's, that's the real why there. So if you yeah. are sacrificing your why to get to your why that sounds counterintuitive exactly. and counterproductive. If you are sacrificing the fringe things or the extra spending or the extra re- relaxation to get to a bigger why, great. Those are yeah. probably the things you need to be sacrificing. Yeah. So I think what you just said there is a great way to keep that in mind for people. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's the, it's the perspective that sometimes is forgotten when it's just like, you know, scorched earth, you know, burn everything. We're sacrificing everything for this end. And I'm like, well, that may get you there faster. It may end up bigger dollars and assets wise, but if you've sacrificed the most valuable things along the way, it, it may not, it, the cost may have been too great. And so I'm not saying that we don't sacrifice, but I am saying we've got to run that calculation in our mind of like, what exactly should we be sacrificing? What's worth the sacrifice? So um, hundred percent. I, I don't know why we got on that topic, but oh yeah, just because you, <laughs> you said the, you know, your goal was family. And so you, you might be growing slower, which you're not growing that slow. You're doing great. Um, and, and <laughs> because you want to focus more on the family side of that. And so for somebody, especially a a new, new investor, mother or father, give us some insights to little tips that you have maybe learned as you've made this transition into an investing mother, Um, maybe some tips for for people trying to do the same thing. Sure. Um, You mean kind of in general or doing it as a parent? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, all of it. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. So I think first of all, a a big overarching tip is I do feel real estate is very, um, it's a people business. It's very networking heavy. Um, There's a lot of of tribal knowledge out there and great learning that you can get just from having conversations with people. So um, if you're not an extrovert, (laughs) which I am, so that's helped me. If you're not one, you know, try to, try to push yourself. Um, Networking is really important. You want to find good people to work with. Uh, There are so many key players in investing, whether it's, you know, an agent or a loan officer or um, just fellow investors who can give you tips you need to be working with good people. Um, And I've, you know, taken it to the point where I think a month after I bought my first four family, I started a meetup and it started small. It was a handful of other St. Louis folks who reached out to me after they saw a write-up that I posted on Bigger Pockets. But, you know, I stopped and took an evening to post a write-up to Bigger Pockets about my first investment. And then I answered all the the emails and Bigger Pockets messages that came to me after that. And then I coordinated all of us to get together for a beer and talk real estate. Mm -hmm. And over time that's grown from, I think there were like six or eight of us to now um, when we're in person right now, we're virtual, but when we're in person, there can be upwards of 40 people at this event. And we have five different sponsors who just help us kind of secure the location and some appetizers and a beverage for everybody. And it's this big um, network that we can all really rely on, learn from, bounce ideas off of. So networking is huge. Um, And then as a parent, I think, you know, my big tip would be going back to kind of the discussion we just had, use those little bits of time around the family time uh, to your best advantage. So, um, you know, early on, I used to get up at 4, 430 to get a workout and an hour or two of real estate stuff in before my daughter woke up. Um, and I also lately it's been more in the evenings, you know, after my kids are in bed, I'll spend Mm -hmm. a couple hours working on some stuff and I, I fit it in where I can 
because I, it's important to me. It's fun to me. I want to make it happen. Um, and that's another cool thing about real estate. There's a lot that you can do, you know, early morning, late in the evening, the hustle that you can bring that, you know, a nine to five, I don't know how far it's going to get you to be putting in all these extra hours all the Mm -hmm. time, but with real estate, it can really get you far if you're willing to put in the extra hustle and the early morning or the late evening hours. Yeah, no, that's perfect. Yeah. Two, two great tips. It's just, you just have to be intentional about fitting in that time. Otherwise it'll get filled up with something else. And so, yeah, those, whether you, whether you're writing goals down or whatever your process is, you just have to be intentional and systematic Hey, this hour every night is is at least one hour every evening in real estate, and it's surprising how that will stack up over time. I mean, it you'll you'll eventually get that first deal or that fifth deal or whatever if you fit that in um, around your job and around your family and the other important things in in life. So those are those are some great tips. How has now you have um, military background? So how has that so the training from the military? How has that shaped your mind and helped your mind um, in the in the real estate and just just in a success mindset in general? How has that helped you? Yeah, I think um, my Marine Corps background, both being raised in the Marine Corps, my dad was a career Marine, and then being in it myself has done a lot for me in life in general, and it, it applies to real estate. Um, I actually even and wrote uh, an article for Bigger Pockets, um, their blog about the, the five ways that the military has helped me as an investor. And, you know, a lot of it comes down to just being willing to do hard things, first of all. I mean, when I was joining the Marine Corps, um, I had, you know, just graduated college. I could have spent my summers during college going on trips with my friends instead of going to officer candidate school in Quantico. Um, officer candidate school was like a very, you know, punishing camp all summer. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But it was um, exciting to be doing something that challenging. And it felt uh, like I was growing as a person when I did that. So I think forcing myself to do that, even though it was not easy, um, you know, I had always been an active person, but it was still I I had to build to really get strong enough and fast enough and have the endurance, um, both physical and mental for officer candidate school and for becoming a Marine. So I think that is huge, just being willing to do hard things because real estate, especially early on, it can be hard, you know, that overall it's simple. It's not rocket science, but it's also not easy. Um, there are different moving pieces. It can take a while to break in depending on the market cycle. It might be really hard to find good deals or when you can find good deals, it's hard to find the lending and you have to get creative there. So it's not easy and you have to be comfortable doing difficult things. Another thing that the military really gave me was um, comfort operating in uncertain scenarios and uncertain situations. And that's huge for real estate too. Again, lots of moving pieces, um, lots of different scenario planning, and you can, uh, you know, get into analysis paralysis to death and never actually make a move. And the Marine Corps really instilled in me, get to an 80% plan and go, because you will never have perfect information. So I really try to take that to heart. I, you know, run my numbers, look at a couple scenarios, and then I make a call. Is this something I'm going to continue pursuing or not? And either I'm going to cut it off so that I can start focusing my efforts elsewhere, or I'm going to pursue it hard and figure it out along the way. Um, And I think that one's huge too. You talk to a lot of people who just have always been interested in real estate, but never actually took the step to invest Mm -hmm. Um, so that's something that I hope everyone listening today can, can take away, do hard things and just, you know, get to an 80% solution and go, because you're going to get so much further just by putting yourself out there. Yeah, no, that's huge. I, I don't know that I've heard that 80 per, so 80% plan and go. I really like that because early on in my investing career and, and I'm sure in a lot of others, um, on the first few deals, there's sometimes we self-sabotage it. Sometimes we'll talk ourselves out of it. And if in, in the business that we're in, especially buying in, you know, most scenarios we're buying distressed properties from distressed owners, there's always a reason to not buy that place. There's always something we can, we can always justify. Yeah. We, you know, let's walk away from this one. And, and, and because we don't have 100% of the plan figured out or hundred percent of the, it's, there's still some unknowns 
And that can keep a lot of people from making that first purchase. And, uh, and so I love that 80% plan, an 80% plan and go for it. Uh, I think that's crucial because I think that mindset of having to have everything perfect can sometimes it'll slow us down and sometimes keep us from ever actually acting. So, yeah, absolutely. There's never a perfect investment or a perfect plan, or maybe there's an investment that you think is perfect, but that's not going to be the reality. There might be investments out there that don't quite look perfect, but you get into it, you find something interesting about it after you own it, and it turns out to be a perfect investment. You know, it's just, you're never going to know everything. Um, I did have a, you know, a property using kind of the example you're just talking about where um, it was in a solid area. I knew that it needed a ton of work. Most of it was cosmetic but it did need some help with the foundation. So St. Louis has, I, I live in invest in St. Louis. We've got basements um, and, you know, plenty of these older properties in the city need foundation repairs. And yeah. that scares off a lot of people. And this property had actually already fallen out of contract once because of this basement. Um, and so I went in there and I just, I got during the due diligence period, I got three different quotes on how to handle the foundation and then I just worked it into my numbers um, and we went with it. And it was definitely not a perfect process. Um, I went over on budget, not actually on the foundation because I got those quotes, but on the interior um, cosmetic updates, there were a couple different glitches that happened along the way. And I did end up putting more money into that property than I expected, but I was able to refinance some of it back out. And I actually one unit was vacant and the other was renting for 750 when I got it. And now those units are rented for 1400 and 1500. So, you know, it's just an example of it was a little messy. It did not go perfectly, but we really were able to push rents. It cash flows well now. And I'm proud of that property. You know, yeah. we did a lot of hard work on that property. So that story is a perfect example of the, of those things you just mentioned, 80% plan and go you dealt with, uh, or you were you you were able to be comfortable in some uncertainty, right, of what was going on with that house, and and you weren't afraid of doing hard things. The foundations are always a little bit scary, right? That and that can be very difficult. So I think that's that your Marine Corps uh, mindset definitely helped you uh, get that deal. That's so cool. Such yeah, a absolutely. good case study there. Awesome. Absolutely. Okay, so so talk to us a little bit more. Um, now that you've been doing this for a while, you're obviously talking to a lot of other investors with, with the, what we just learned about your mindset. What are some big mindset? What are some really common mindsets that keep others from succeeding in real estate or success in general that you think just impede people from moving forward? What are some common mis- um, yeah. poor mindsets, I guess? I don't know how to say yeah. that. Yeah. But- I think, I think the biggest one is just letting fear dictate your decisions. I think there are a lot of people out there who um, they want the perfect information. They want to know everything and because unknowns are scary and there's always an unknown. There's always Always. at least one, if not many unknowns (laughs) with any deal that you're getting into. Um, So they let fear dictate their decision-making and oftentimes it leads to not making a decision at all or not doing anything because they think, well, you know, I saw that property, it seemed okay, but there was that one thing that scared me. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, there's this one thing about this area that scares me. And so they're just sacrificing weeks and months and years of taking actions that can get them further down their journey um, because of fear. So, and I say all this, not because I'm some like super courageous person who's never afraid. I'm <laughs> frequently afraid. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I say this because I am very familiar with fear. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think I grew up in an environment. I was fortunate to grow up in an environment where fear was accepted, but then we, we did our best to move past it. Um, and now as an adult, I also have, you know, a partner, my husband, um, who he doesn't actually work in the real estate with me but I'll run things by him when things are keeping me up at night. And Mm -hmm. he's the type too, who can just go, you know, Megan, none of this is the end of the world. You'll Mm -hmm. figure it out. And he pushes me forward too. So I think the fear and then kind of connected to that, having people around you surrounding yourself by the people who can push you forward when you're having the doubts. And that doesn't mean that, you know, you see a property, you analyze it and the numbers are trash and you, 
have someone push for you forward anyway. Yeah. But surround right. yourself with people who have a growth mindset and who um, also will be afraid but do things anyway. Yeah, I think those are both uh, really, really big. And then I think uh, one more that I'll add is not being willing to self-educate early on, I actually think is a really big uh, mindset issue. I think there hmm. are people out there, you know, I see them sometimes, there are a couple of them who might float through my meetup every once in a while or try to reach out uh, to me online somewhere on social media. Um, and they want to come with you and have you come to you and have you give them all the answers. And I think people really need to take on responsibility for their own self-education and get themselves as far as they can with podcasts like this, books, blogs, all the different resources that are out there. Take advantage of those and get yourself spun up to a point where your questions are a little more nuanced and mm -hmm. a, a little further down the education path than just, I want to invest in real estate. What do you think I should do? Yeah, And I think that's a big thing because not only does it um, show that you're not taking responsibility for your own education, but it doesn't leave a great impression on the people that you're trying to network with. And I mentioned yeah. earlier that I think networking is so important in this business and this industry. So those are a few of the things that I would say kind of hold people back early on. Yeah, those are, those are perfect. And, and yeah, we, I see them a lot. I mean, I've even, I've even noticed them in myself time to time. So it's oh, definitely yeah. good I mean, to be we're all of guilty yeah. of all of it. <laughs> and, and I think the education one is so huge. I mean, there is so much content out there that's just, it's free. I mean, it, mm -hmm. yeah, and the books are 10 or $15 or whatever on Amazon, but um yeah, YouTube has so much. Bigger Pockets is is phenomenal for the the content that they provide. The podcast is was a huge part of me getting started and feeling comfortable. One of the biggest things with that podcast was that there were so many um, examples of deals and and success stories of somebody getting started and succeeding. And that I had to to listen to that on a daily basis because it was my it's what kept me kept the faith going that I could do it and I and other people had done it. And so just, yeah, wherever you need to go for your education and for your motivation and, and encouragement to keep going, I it's out there and it's usually free, if not very inexpensive. And that can be, that that's a very easy investment. And by, by sometimes trying to shortcut that and just go ask a, um, you know, a mentor or somebody that's an expert what to do, you're not becoming the person that you need to become to achieve what you want to achieve because you haven't put in the work and you haven't went through the struggle and the difficulty. And so you're actually kind of shortchanging yourself of the person, not just the doors you want to own, but the person that you can become in the process of getting those doors, which ultimately who we become is actually the most important thing, not, not what we own. And so, yeah, yeah there's no shortcuts. There's no shortcuts of, of much value, I guess is what I'll say. Um, Absolutely. That's huge. Um, that's huge. Talk to us a little bit more. You mentioned um, your next your next property. You're looking to be 16 units or, or greater, right? Um, mm -hmm. Talk to us about the making the transition from duplexes, fourplex to something like that, and what's kind of been the process, what you've been going through to make that jump to 16 units. Yeah, you know, a lot of it is education. Again, mm -hmm. certainly there are many things that are similar between a four family and a 16 family building, but there's also a lot that's different. I mean, right off the bat, your lending is going to be different. You're going to have to go with commercial lending instead mm -hmm. of conventional loans. So you've got to figure that out. You've got to find a good lender or two or three in your area. Um, you have to make sure you understand what it's going to take to qualify and how you're qualified for a loan like that because it's different. Um, you need to do a lot of networking with brokers and other people who are actually around these deals. There just aren't as many large buildings as there mm -hmm. are small. You know, in, in mm -hmm. my market in St. Louis, I mean, you can't go more than a couple blocks without seeing a duplex or a four family, but finding, you know, a 16 or 24 unit that fits kind of my criteria and the neighborhoods I want, they're, they're just not on every block. Um, and lots of these brokers who do get these listings and are, are trying to help sell or even sellers who want to sell directly to somebody, they're going to want to look for someone who has experience. And even my experience in the one to four family space, depending on the size of the building, they might not see it as translating to enough experience for them to want to spend time with me. Yeah. 
So, you know, there's just kind of that initial uphill slog of learning and networking and learning and networking and analyzing deals um, and, you know, going to see as much as I can. I mean, there have been a couple where the seller didn't even necessarily want to show it to me because they thought, well, she doesn't own any larger buildings yet. So we don't know if she's even serious. So it's a process in that way. Another thing for me is that this will mark my first partnership. Um, I have, you know, bought the the properties I have so far, just me and, you know, my husband and our funds and, and our planning and our, mm-hmm. my, my work and time into it. Um, and as I go bigger, I am open and excited about partnering for the first time. So I've got a lot of people in my network and there are a handful of them who I'm actively talking with on a weekly basis about different things that we might do together. And I don't have a set partner in place yet, but it's, exciting because now I'm not just getting lead from leads from the brokers or from the, you know, email alerts that I'm getting. I'm also getting leads from these different folks who we've talked about, Hey, maybe if we find something that works for both of us, we'll partner. Um, so partnering is a mindset shift for me because early on I wanted to have all the blame and all the, the mistakes fall on me if, yeah. if something didn't work out, you know, I didn't necessarily want to partner with someone and, you know, him take the blame if it didn't go well for, for us or me, or, you know, I just, my money, my time, my mistakes, all of that, I owned it all. Um, and getting to the point where I'm willing and open to partner with other people, share the responsibilities, delegate things. Um, it took me a little while and it was a little bit of the mindset shift, but I'm, I'm really excited about it now. That's cool. That's cool. And you have, you have started a podcast that's geared around multifamily, right? Uh, Tell Mm -hmm. us a little bit more about that. Yeah. So I actually, after being on the bigger pockets podcast a while back, it was episode um, three, eight, seven, I think uh, I ended up being connected through social media of all places on Instagram with um, Josiah Smelser, who was on the podcast just a few episodes ahead of me. Mm -hmm. And he had this idea, he had been kind of working on this idea of starting a podcast aimed at people in our exact shoes, people who have some experience in the one to four family space, but are ready to make the leap into larger multifamily, whether it's, you know, a 16 unit or a 50 unit or a hundred unit complex, just getting into that true multifamily commercial space. Um, And he wanted to kind of share his own journey along the way, but also be bringing in people who have been doing the same things, who had made the same jump um, and were, you know, either starting kind of early in multifamily or pretty big in it. And so we teamed up, we just launched it in August. We are, I think, four or five episodes in now. And it's been a lot of fun. Um, Mm -hmm. It's funny because prior to the Bigger Pockets podcast in June, I think I had maybe been on a couple podcasts and lately, I, I feel like I'm either recording for Multifamily Mavericks or being on other podcasts all the time. Every week, yeah. I've got one or two interviews. And it's so much fun because it's a yeah. way to connect and network with people you might not with connect with otherwise. Um, and then also like share and give back and hash ideas out. Uh, so yeah, it's been a lot of fun. Multifamily Mavericks, you can find mm-hmm. us kind of wherever podcasts are. Yeah. No, that's cool. I've been kind of keeping an eye on you guys there. That's uh, Josiah was on the podcast. I don't think his episode has actually dropped yet, but we do. We did a, a pretty sweet podcast there that he. I think he mentioned that that was coming down the pipe. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, multifamily mavericks. So we'll definitely put that in the notes uh, for people because I. That's a perfect fit. Um, there's a lot of people. You know, I'm in the same. I'm in that same spot trying to. Um, leave the one, you know, single family or small multifamily into larger deals. And so that's a perfect fit uh, for where I'm at even. So I'll definitely pay attention uh, for what you guys got going on there. Awesome. Um, Well, this has been, this has been awesome. So talk to us. um, We've talked a little bit about mindset, what, what can impede people. um, What are some, how do I say this? So if you had to, give like the one thing that's if you had to pick just the one thing that separates those that succeed and those that that reach their goals what would that be like that habit or that characteristic what would what would that one thing be yeah um i think i'm gonna go with perspective and i use the term perspective to mean just kind of 
how you look at things, your outlook on situations, maybe kind of a level of optimism, but not not overly optimistic. Um, I think there are a lot of the pitfalls we talked about today that come from a place of negativity and fear and uh, just kind of taking the scary things in your mind and blowing them out of proportion, right? Yeah. You think about buying your first investment, a single family or a duplex, and maybe you're looking at a $100,000, $300,000 investment um, and a loan at that amount. And it seems like it could be the end of the world. Yeah. You know, like yeah. this one thing doesn't go well, that's it. You're going to go bankrupt and live under a bridge for the rest of your life. And it seems so scary. But the reality is that even if that first investment doesn't go well, you're probably going to be okay. Maybe yeah. it sets you back a little bit, mm -hmm. or maybe even though it doesn't go the way you want, it still helps propel you forward yeah. a bit because honestly, real estate can be somewhat forgiving yeah. depending on the circumstances. It, it, very, it can be for sure. Yeah. Right. So I think that having perspective in the things that you do, and this, this means, you know, stepping back and reminding yourself, what's the worst that could happen? You know, what is really the worst that could happen here? Do I need to be afraid or, you know, can I push past that fear? Because at the end yeah. of the day, it's not the end of the world. And then kind of reversing that question too and asking yourself, what is the best case scenario that I could be missing out on if I let fear dictate my decision? Yeah. So, you know, if I don't act today, if I wait two more years or four more years or 10 more years because of fear, what's that ultimate lifestyle goal or that ultimate, you know, whatever the type of goal is mm -hmm. that I could achieve 10 years from now if I go ahead and act today? And am I willing to sacrifice that because I'm uncomfortable? So I think perspective is huge. I am um, constantly working on my perspective. And there are some days where I think I stay positive and I, I try to be realistic and uh, think through the fears rather than just get emotional about them. Mm -hmm. And there are plenty of days where I <laughs> just <Sick. laughs> need to go to bed early and start over the next day, you know, but I do yeah. think that perspective is huge. And it really, um, the perspective people have really impacts how they approach problems in life and good problem solvers are the ones who get ahead. So yeah, perspective. man, that's huge. I, I don't know that I've heard somebody say perspective before, and I really like where you, how you package that or how you put that into perspective. <laughs> um, Cause I remember, so I still, I, I'm a solar sales representative. So I, I sell solar systems for houses and, and companies and stuff. That's my full-time gig real estate still, um, still on the side. But, um, but, um, but early on in my career doing that, man, some days I would be so stressed out and just so like down and stressed about the workload that I had. And I had to at a certain point, just be like, this isn't life or death. Why am I treating it this way? Like if I totally screw my job up today, it's not the end of the world. And, and I started, and then so my perspective started to shift. I'm like this is not life or death. This is just a game we play. It's kind of like Monopoly. Hopefully, I win, but I might have to pay some rent along the way. Like, just started to shift that mindset. And so it was a, it was a, it was a lesson that my nine to five has taught me that I've tried to apply in the real estate side. And sometimes I do the same thing. I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to go to bed and we'll reset and we'll start over tomorrow. Hopefully, right. I'll start my day with a better perspective because. Um, you know, the forces that we deal with every day, they're, they're negative. They're, they're, they're designed to be resistive and resistance. And I think that's by divine nature because that's how we become who we're intended to become. So we're not, we're never going to find an easy path, but that's the resistance free. And if we, if we do it, there's probably no reward at the end of it. And so we have to just be able to, to, to face that, have the right perspective, and, uh, and, and power through that. So that's awesome. Um, I love that. A couple of final questions here and then we'll wrap up. Um, we, we kind of already mentioned it. I like to ask everybody, what's your why? And you mentioned family early on. Is there, do you want to expand on that anymore? Maybe there's some future stuff that you want to accomplish too. What, what else is involved in your why? Yeah, I think, um, I, I've actually thought about this a lot recently because, um, if it were just my kids, right? Just spending time with them. I could have easily just said, you know what? I'm going to be a, a stay at home mom. Um, 
my husband was willing to to let me do whatever I wanted there. Yeah. He's really supportive. But it, it is more than that. I think there's this feeling that um, there's so much to experience in life, right? With my family, with my career, with what we build as a family unit. Yeah. And so I think it it kind of boils down to a life that has variety and excitement. You know, I want myself and my family as a whole to enjoy together a life filled with variety and excitement. And that means building businesses together, um, investing in real estate together, taking trips together. I grew up partially living abroad because of being a military kid. And I love travel, especially international. Our kids have already been out of the country a few times. So (laughs) I, you know, all of those things going on hikes together. I love working out and being active. I want to build a life around some variety and some excitement in these experiences because there's, there's so much out there. And I, I think I just have this like fear of missing out. I I don't want to miss those cool experiences. Um, so I haven't boiled down exactly any kind of statement, but that's kind of the why driving me around what I want for me and my family. That's awesome. I love that. And the last question, what are some ways that, um, what are some ways that you are giving back? Um, or that you're, you know, you're giving to others, helping others out. And that can be maybe stuff that you're currently doing or maybe goals that you have down the road. Yeah. Um, well, you know, I think I really believe in everyone should keep paying it forward in this industry, right? So when you get to a certain point, you start to realize you're not just asking other people for advice or for clarity on things in this industry, you're getting people coming to you. And so I've tried to make it a priority Um, even if it means it's, you know, catching up on emails in the evenings to, to find a way to give back to, to people around me who are looking for, for some help and some answers. And it doesn't mean I am here to just, you know, hand it out and give everyone a, you know, prescribed way to do things for their Mm -hmm. life. But I'm always trying to answer folks when they want to reach out with questions. I feel like multifamily Mavericks is another way of doing that now. It's a weekly podcast and we're really trying to dig in and bring um, important, exciting, important might not be the word, but exciting and inspiring guests yeah. who can really help others learn the multifamily business. Um, and then, you know, outside of real estate, uh, I, my husband and I have um, tried to give back our time and, and our money where it makes sense. And we're always kind of looking for how we fit that into the way we, we do things in our business and in our life. Yeah. Perfect. Awesome. Well, in addition to uh, listening to the Multifamily Mavericks podcast, where else can people track you down and follow you? Sure. I am on, active on Bigger Pockets and LinkedIn and on Instagram at Part Time Empire. Um, that's where I probably spend the most time just kind of sharing what I'm up to, what's happening with my real estate, what's happening with the podcast. And I really like connecting with people on there. It's interesting how you can kind of make friends through social media who you've never met in person. But I mean, there are at this point, a handful of people who I would call pretty good friends. Yeah, we still haven't had the chance to meet in person. Um, So yeah, you can find me in all those places. Yeah, no, that's that social media has been interesting that way to definitely connect people. And it's been so cool. And, And again, just me and you, thanks for coming on. I mean, I basically listened to you on a podcast, reached out to you via Instagram. And here we are having a good chat. Hopefully we meet in person one day. Um, that'll yeah. be cool at some seminar somewhere. But um, best of luck to you. And seriously, this conversation has been great. Hopefully, um, I, well, I have definitely been enlightened. Hopefully the listeners have too. So I uh, appreciate you coming on. Thank you so much. And thank you for what you do. I think anyone who spends their time and effort putting out content like this, like you're just, you're giving back. You're doing a service for others. So thanks for what you do. And thanks for having me on. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Money Maven Project Podcast. A true maven shares knowledge with others. So be sure to share this podcast and leave a review. Thanks so much. And until next time, live life with intention.